This video is sponsored by The Daily Upside, a free high quality daily newsletter that I enjoy reading every morning with my cup of coffee. Check out the link in the description to find out more. What you see here is a chart of Russia's foreign currency earnings in April each year since 2007. Usually Russia earned around 6.7 billion US dollars more than it spent. However, last April the numbers did not collapse, to the contrary they increased sevenfold. In other words, Russia is now making more money than ever. But how the heck was it able to pull that off? And does that mean that Russia can now easily afford to fight a longer war in Ukraine? To understand how Russia can make so much money, we first need to understand how making money is different for a country than for people like you and me. You see, a country like Russia consists of a lot of people, businesses and indeed the government. Now whenever any of these actors spends money on imports or other foreign things, money leaves the country. Economists refer to these money flows as capital outflows. On the other hand, if Russians export goods or services, they earn foreign currency. Economists refer to these types of money flows as capital inflows. The chart that you saw at the beginning showed how Russians are now collectively making more money than they spent. Capital inflows were bigger than capital outflows. So the country was effectively making money and this is what economists call a current account surplus. And this news worried many because it could use that foreign money that it accumulates to buy more military equipment to potentially keep fighting longer in Ukraine. But whether or not that worry is justified depends a lot on how Russia generates this current account surplus. You see, if Russia is making that money from booming exports, that could mean that this is something that will continue in the future and that sanctions are not working. On the other hand, it could be that that money surplus is just a sign that Russia can no longer import the crucial technologies, machines and military equipment that it needs to keep on fighting. What's more, Russia stopped publishing most of its detailed trade data after the war. So, Watson? I guess we'll have to do a little bit of digging. So has Russia's export industry paradoxically boomed after sanctions? To find out we first need to establish what Russia's main exports actually are. If you look at the composition of Russian exports in 2020, you'll see that 37% of all of its export revenue comes from oil. Roughly 6% comes from gas, 4% from coal and only 53% from all other exports. Just for comparison, let's have a look at the export composition of the United States. While it rivals Russia for oil and gas exports, the diversified character of its economy means that these categories only account for roughly 12% of its economy. This is why Russia's economy is sometimes mockingly referred to as a glorified gas station. But for waging a war, it doesn't really matter what brings in the money as long as the money keeps coming in. Anyway, if Russia indeed earned more from energy exports, then there can be two possible explanations for this. Either the volume that it exported went up, or the price of its exports went up. And the evidence so far is revealed after a shout out to the sponsor of this video. As anyone who spends time consuming financial content is well aware, finding insightful sources that are not highly biased is incredibly difficult. Whether I'm producing one of my latest videos or I'm simply trying to keep up to date on the latest market moving news, it's imperative to have reliable sources which I can count on day in, day out. Which brings me to the daily upside. A completely free business and finance newsletter Letter that provides clear, concise and occasionally witty insights into the market. Six days a week, The Daily Upside delivers crisp and actionable insights straight into my inbox. Not only do they deliver next level content on the large stories that I read about in the Financial Times or Wall Street Journal, but they also service niche and interesting stories about finance and economics that I otherwise wouldn't have discovered. For example, while making this video, I saw the Daily Upside cover the latest developments surrounding the US stepping in to supply the EU with liquefied natural gas, also known as LNG, the German approval of a new LNG terminal, and finally the fact that McDonald's and Renault have now left Russia for good. So if you are someone looking to understand the stories impacting the global economy, I highly 
highly recommend the daily upside. You can sign up using the link below in the description. It's completely free, it takes three seconds to subscribe and if you don't like it, you can always unsubscribe. Anyway, back to the evidence. Most of my non-Russian sources confirmed that the volume of both oil and gas flowing to Europe via pipeline has contracted by roughly 10 to 20%. What's more, many oil shipping companies have voluntarily refused to ship Russian oil to other countries. That is, until the Greek fleet stepped in. And as a consequence, Russian oil shipping volumes are now actually up a little bit. Although they are selling at discounted prices compared to the rest of the world, these prices are still higher than what Russia used to sell for. Similarly, when Russian liquefied natural gas was boycotted by Korea and Japan, India stepped in to buy it at a discount. So sanctions do really hurt Russian energy sales, but the prices that they get are still higher thanks to the war. What's more, Europe is not buying at a discount. I can confirm from personal experience that oil and gas prices in Europe are sky high. And that can explain why Russia is now earning roughly twice as much from its energy exports to Europe. Finally, the latest numbers point to an increase in Russia's overall export revenues from, you guessed it, China. So is it indeed Russian export strength and can Russia therefore keep paying for a longer war? Yes, that's definitely part of the story, but it's not the whole story. After all, both oil and gas prices have been at this price point before and then Russia didn't record these record surpluses. So perhaps the missing link could just be that Russia's insane current account surpluses are just an indication that Russia can no longer import crucial goods and services from the West. Sadly here again I was hindered by the fact that the Russian customs stopped reporting crucial import statistics after the war. Luckily whatever Russia is importing someone else is exporting. Now confess. You are utterly taken aback. I am. And here research revealed that Russia is now importing almost 40% less from all of its crucial trading partners, including China. And sure, while Russia is fairly self-sufficient when it comes to the basics, it is highly reliant on importing advanced goods such as chemicals and machines. But if that would just mean that Russians are now not able to upgrade their phone anymore, that wouldn't necessarily impact its war paying or waging abilities, now would it? However, these numbers might also reflect that the Russian military is struggling to buy replacement equipment. And sure, then you could say, but Yuri, they have the raw materials, they have the blueprints, they have the technology, they can just make this stuff themselves. Well, this is what economists call import substitution and Russia has been trying this ever since 2014, but so far Bank of Finland research revealed that it has not been very successful. So what's really behind Russia's impressive current account surpluses? The boringly nuanced answer is that it is both an increase in export revenue, not due to rising volumes, but due to rising prices, and at the same time, it's a massive decline in crucial imports. <laughs> How absurdly simple. Every problem is absurdly simple when it is explained to you. Bum, bum, bum. But does this mean that they can afford a long war? Well, from a monetary perspective, yes. Yes, they can. But that money might ironically be rather useless if they cannot buy or produce the stuff that they need to fight that war. However, if one thing is clear is that both Russia and Europe are decoupling. Russia in trying to sell energy to other countries in the world and Europe in trying to move away from Russian energy. If you're interested in what that means and why Russia and Europe were so dependent on each other in the first place, check out this video over here of me talking to Professor Brunemeyer about that. And if you're still a bit fuzzy on capital inflows, outflows and the current account, check out this video over here. Finally, if you want to support my work and discuss these and other issues with me in a small Discord server, then consider becoming a patron or member of this channel using the links in the description. 